I just want to say that thank you so much for showing up uh, on the middle of the week. And it's such an honor to be invited, uh, especially since I'm a, I'm a, you know, a San Franciscan boy. And I grew up here um, and at the far end of Mission Street where San Francisco ended and Daily City began when I first came as a refugee uh, from Vietnam. And I used to take the bus, the 14 Mission, for five cents up and down. Um, um, that's how old I am. It, it was five cents a transfer last the whole day. And you can even take the cable car with it. And, <laughs> and I, I explored the city and I listened to the voices of the city. Um, and I grew up in the city, but I never imagined one day I'm sitting in an auditorium and uh, reading from uh, my American work because I didn't speak English when I came here and English is my third language. So it's really a strange uh, voyage for me you know, 40 years since I came here, that uh, I am here and that literature literally took me around the world. You know, I've, I've sat at many uh, events in around the world from Bali to Beijing to Shanghai to London. And it's like, uh, it's extraordinary moment because each time I have this self out of body experience thinking, how did I get here? And the only thing I can think of is because I love to tell stories. And so, uh, without any further ado, I've written three books, but this one is being celebrated. So I've, I picked a, a, a story that has to do with very much uh, the city. All the stories are really about the Bay Area but, and being a refugee. But this one, it's about the Tenderloin, which um, uh, <laughs> to me is dear because this is where I go and eat most of my Vietnamese food. Um, and it's called Slingshot, it's page 39. And the voice is that of a, a tomboy around 15 years old. This dude, right, a loner and everything, made his sorry ass part of our family and mama insisted that me and Pammy call him Uncle Steve, but I would not. I called him US for short. US came to eat our restaurant a couple years ago and ordered mama special hotel soup kept saying he hadn't eaten authentic Vietnamese cooking since he was stationed in Nam and such. Next thing you know, dude's a regular. And Mama and Pammy, sweet to please, Pammy started to treat him like a long lost relative. Poor Uncle Steve, Mama once said in Vietnamese, he's a nice man and alone. He fought on your father's side during the war and even knew his infantry. So treat him nice, you two, especially you, little monkey. Sure, I say. Sure, mama. Or whatever. The thing about regulars is that they sometimes get too personal. They, like, totally get on your nerves. They don't leave at closing time. They walk up the cash register when you're way too busy adding up the bills or something and start kicking it with you, yammering and yakking till you get real distracted and lose your place, and then you just want to tell them to shut the hell up. I mean, they pay for good cooking and give a tip for good service, but excuse me, what does it say on the menu that our special dinner combo of spring roll salad and curry chicken for $6.99 come with psychological treatment? Some regulars just hang around late, you know, and ask if we need help cleaning up or if we want an escort to our apartment after we close, even if it's only two blocks away. And what dish we're preparing for two more, but like, hello, it's the same menu every day for the last three years. Some of them just didn't want to go home, period, and I'll tell you why. Most regulars are hell of a loners. But US, he was worse. Kept telling us how he hated being American and everything, hated this damn country, hated how his wife took the kids and skipped out of his sorry ass back to Texas after he came back a little looney toony from Nam. Sometimes US get way annoying when he pretended like he's somehow Vietnamese because he's been there and knew some stuff, like he knew all about that. You dress up nice and you go visit relatives and you give money in red envelope to little children, am I right? About wedding traditions, the groom's side of the family comes over to the bride's side and bearing gifts wrapped in red. They carry a roasted pig on a lacquer tray and fruits and tea and the smarter ones and the smaller ones, isn't that, Pammy? And about funeral arrangements. 
You wear white headbands, you burn paper offerings to the dead, and you play real sad music. I remember people in the rural areas prefer to live near their ancestors' graves so they can tend to them. Hell, I've seen graves in people's backyards live and die together. That's the way you people are, am I right? If that's not enough to yank your chain, there was this hella annoying phrase you was always used when he came a little tipsy. Tôi cũng là người Việt Nam. I'm also Vietnamese. And sometimes mama, when she's in a good mood, she laugh and clasp her hands and answer him with a broken English. Uncle Steve, you, you Vietnam, people like us. Whenever he heard that boy do be beaming like mama just announced that he won the Oscar for best actor or something. But mama was only humoring his ass. I mean, you as a Vietnamese? Who was he kidding? A doofus with tech from Texas with receding blonde hair, a thick mustache, and a beer belly who loves to wear obnoxious smelling cologne and a loud Hawaiian shirt on the weekend? Please put black pajamas on that dude and he'd be looking more like, I don't know, a chocolate truffle or something. <laughs> anyway, soon US got too friendly. He brought us flowers, irises, and tulips, and roses, and what have you. And then he sent us postcards when he traveled. U.S. travels for free or for very little money because he's a baggage handler at United Air, at SFO. London, been there. Hong Kong, done that. Morocco, been there. Even if it's only for the weekend, you must be going off to someplace far. That one time he came back from France, he got us gifts. To, he got a, a little purse for Pammy, a blouse for me, a hat for Grandma Tin, who I call Grandma T, the first time she got hired by Mama to help out with the cooking a few years ago. And for Mama, a real kick-ass turquoise necklace. We all say, no, 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 thank you, especially Mama, who kept saying, no gift, Uncle Steve, no gift. Postcard, okay. Flowers, okay. Expensive gift, not okay and waved her hand in the air like she was hailing a cab, but U.S. wouldn't listen. Tôi cũng là người Việt Nam. He kept saying, tôi cũng là người Việt Nam, until Mama pretended to be angry and placed U.S.'s gift in a pile on the table, and he had to give up and offer the loot to Grandma T, and she took it too, because she has more grandchildren than she can feed. Still, it got so that U.S. wouldn't think twice about going back to the kitchen and standing there like he was the chef himself, tasting the soup and chatting with Mama and Grandma T about this and that, that and this. It didn't matter when we were way too busy, U.S. would yap, yap, yap. Sometimes he says something stupid to Mama like, Mrs. Nguyen, correct me if I'm wrong, but doesn't the river in Ben Tre rise real fast sometimes in the afternoon, especially when it's monsoon season? And Mama would stop what she was doing and nod and squint her eyes and stare at the industrial-sized fridge as if she could see the damn river rising from somewhere behind all that steely grayness. Another time, she was preparing ban tam bê, a southern Vietnamese dish that uses coconut, mint, and pork skin and a bunch of, of other good but unidentifiable stuff. And U.S. came in and said, Mrs. Nguyen, there's no better coconut than the ones grown in Ben Tre, am I not right? <laughs> and Mama would giggle and answer, Uncle Steve, you right, you right. Fresh coconut over there, only cans over here. Not the same, no good. <laughs> Pammy too, she's so sweet to U.S., but I guess she's sweet to everybody, that's just the way she is. She's a year older than me, but she acts like she's fresh off the boat. Just me, I guess. I'm the one who told the bums to get lost and the dog and customer to clear out. I'm the one who ambushed Dwayne Kowalski on that bike path that one time at Golden Gate Park on the seventh grade field trip and shot him with on the kneecap with Papa's slingshot using my favorite ammunition, a jawbreaker. A purple one at that. Because he kept teasing Pammy, yanking her long braid and stuff told that child to cut her short like mine to avoid the damn assholes like Dwayne, but would she listen? Nuh-uh. So anyway, dude was lame for a whole week and couldn't tell people that a girl shot him with a damn piece of candy. 
So guess who was the one to tell U.S. what's up? Yep, yours truly. Like that one time, right, when U.S. insisted on saying, after closing time and helping me with pay me clean up, it wasn't necessary, we all say, but dude insisted. And suddenly, when we were all stacking chairs onto the table to mop the floor, he got all misty eye and blurted, you are my favorite Mekong Delta girls. So smart, so filial. I mean, Jesus almighty, I adore you both like my own. Mekong Delta girls? Ew, what's up with that corny, crazy shit? I mean, out of nowhere, this gringo's confession, major vomit material. I get totally bugging when he be talking like that, like there we were in the dingy little dive in tender full of frick's loin with the smell of fish sauce and pine saw up our nostrils while the bums milled about outside looking like zombies. And U.S. talked to us like we were those images in the grease stained brush paintings hanging on our walls. You know, wearing conical hats and planting rice by the river and rowing boats and singing folk songs and leading them oxen home to the village or shit like that. So I say, U.S., you're crazy if you think we're your girls. That's heinous, all right? We ain't living in your sorry-ass Mekong Delta fantasy shit. Get a grip, we took a trip. We're in San Francisco, like America. <laughs> you ask, you ain't no Vietnamese, and you know it. Boy, you should have seen him. Butt sucker had that hurt puppy look. Your mouthy, Tammy, he said, shaking his head, sighing. But I know you got a good heart. Then he said, I know we're in America. I know I'm not Vietnamese, racially. All I'm saying is that after what I went through, Vietnam is part of me too. I don't know, maybe you see it someday. Yeah, I said, sure US, whatever. So it was escalating warfare between U.S. and me because that time of love declaration from U.S. was nothing compared with the other time when U.S. really got me royally bugging and in hell of a trouble with mama. He saw me with Adam K. You know, bedroom eyes, Adam, tall, brown hair down to his big shoulders, real light skin with a tattoo of a coiling snake with a blood red rose in its mouth on his left arm and with a turquoise earring and the best mouth in last year's yearbook. Anyway, we were just walking and holding hands on the street, right? And I didn't see U.S. spying on us or nothing, but when I got to the restaurant, he was all nervous and everything. At first, I thought he was developing a tick or was having a stroke maybe, but then he say, I saw you with tattoo guide today, Tammy. I hope you don't mind a piece of advice, but I just don't trust the look on that one. <sighs> Sorry, I'm lost my line. Oh, I've seen him real chummy with them gangbangers scoring some dope on Hyde the other day. I tell you what I think. He's the type that will get in trouble sooner or later, so go slow, okay? Tattoo guy. I couldn't believe my ears. He was like dissing Adam. My bedroom eyes, Adam. Worse, U.S. be talking to me like I was his own daughter. Not. No wonder Texan wife and kids took off on his sorry ass. Had to. Either that or Harry Curie. Besides, homie ain't relative no matter how much he fantasized himself to be. A regular still a customer. And he's not supposed to tell his waitress who to date, period. He's supposed to sit at his table, you know, and order and eat and say, ah, that was delicious, miss, thank you very much, and leave a big tip and then leave. So I totally lost it. I said, U.S., why don't you do us all a favor and just fuck off? Unfortunately, Mama heard it all the way in the kitchen because I said it loud and she got real mad. There were only two Hispanic customers at afternoon, and they were too busy looking in each other's eyes like Romeo and Julieta. 
and they didn't give a hood what we did, but mama, she cared because right away she came out and made me apologize to U.S. even when she didn't even know a quarter of the story. Now mama, she may not know the true meaning of fuck off, but she pretty much guessed that it wasn't no nice respecting phrase like, hello mister, how are you today? Or are you ready to order, madam? But I wouldn't apologize to U.S. Nah, no freaking way. No, mama, I say, no apologies. Little monkey apologize. Mama said it again in Vietnamese, her voice steady and cool as cucumber, which only meant one thing. Mount St. Helen wind was ready to blow serious lava. <laughs> Don't be rude to him. Uncle Steve, he's just like a relative. Hell no, I yelled. Why would I apologize? He ain't no real uncle. He certainly ain't my father. He ain't nothing, Mama, or nobody, so how's he family? Mama didn't answer. She just looked kind of surprised that I blew first. But it was like Mama didn't even know what happened, and she automatically sided with this dude, an outsider. So I went on in this cold, bitchy voice, you know, pretending like I just figured something out that very second. I say, oh, 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 wait a minute, Mama, I get it. He's going to be my new papa soon, am I right? And I heard Pammy suck in her breath. I mean, I shouldn't have said that, I know, but I was still bugging and before, and, and therefore went too far and dissed me on matre in the process. So she slapped me, slapped right in front of U.S. and Pammy and the Romeo Julieta couple who abandoned the banana flambe, threw some money on the table and made like El Viento. For one thing, no chef should slap no waitress in front of no customers. That's no good for business for sure. For another, no waitress should cry in front of no regulars but all men. I just couldn't help it. I bawled. Go ahead, mama, I said through my curtain of tears. You just go ahead and hit me some more to make yourself happy. But I ain't apologizing to this woods, all right? Who asked him to harass me in the first place? I don't care if he's been to Bentrea, mama. I don't care if he's new papa's infantry. I mean, what does it matter now? We're living in tender freaking loin, and papa is dead. Bury somewhere in the re-education camp by the goddamn Viet Cong, and nobody asked me for permission to let this wannabe ruin my life. I gear myself for the next assault, but it didn't come. Mama's face suddenly changed from being totally bugging to this real sad look. She raised her hand like she was going to re-slap me, but she just turned it slowly toward her own face instead. Then she wept into it like a baby. Oh my goodness, even now, after all that happened, even after I did what I did later on, I can still see her thin shoulders tremble and shake. Shouldn't have said all that stuff. I know, I know, my tongue, I swear, it's sharper than Ginzu knives. Tell you the truth, I'd rather she re-slap me, no problem. Huh? It's easier to take than her crying. I couldn't bear it. I felt so hurt inside, like somebody was twisting a knife in my guts or pinching my heart with her long, gnarly nails. So I did what came naturally. I grabbed and hugged her, my mama, who once held tiny old me and Pammy in her arms when we sailed out to sea in that stinking old crowded boat from Bentrea a zillion nights ago, but who felt suddenly so small in my arms so frail, so bony, who suffer so much already. Oh, mama, I'm sorry, I say. I'm so sorry. And then Pammy came rushing to us for a team hug, and we cried, the three of us, like we were in some weird choir practice. So everything, you know, Les Mis, Les Vietnamis, or whatever was happening right in front of U.S., and the dude be acting like he was all tied up. He trembled like he was struggling to get out of some invisible rope until finally his hairy arms slowly reached out like an elephant's trunk toward me and Pammy and Mama, trying to touch us maybe, 
but before he could accomplish his mission impossible, I shot him my special Medusa laser stare and froze that XGI in his track. That was when Grandma T came out of the kitchen with her ladle. She looked at us for a second or two, then she sighed and shook her gray head like she'd seen it all before. And she waved the ladle in the air like a magic wand. Try, I try, she said, her voice low and throaty. You people are worse than the monsoon. Please, enough with the crying already. My beef soup went sour back there because of your wailing. <laughs> we all started to giggle because Grandma T's voice was raspy from years of smoking. She sounded like a Vietnamese Darth Vader or somebody cool <laughs> like that and her wrinkled up face was frowning like a sad old clown. U.S. laughed too, even though he probably didn't get 90% of what she was saying, Mr. I'm also Vietnamese. <laughs> but Grandma T was stern to him. She pointed the ladle toward the door and said, Uncle Steve, you should go and handle baggage. Let us women folks take care of things. U.S. stared at us like he wanted to say something, but nothing came out. So he just looked at Grandma T's ladle like he was really thinking hard about something and then he nodded and left. Me, I was still bugging and thought the dude got away easy. I don't know. I kind of expected Grandma T to turn his sorry ass into a warthog or something. U.S. did not come back the next day or the next. A week went by, then another. Soon, everyone started to wonder, including all the other regulars, whatever happened to Uncle Steve, the ex-GI who thought he was Vietnamese? Everybody but me, I, I guess. I mean, I didn't care. U.S. was finally out of my hair. Good. Why ask why? It was like having a vacation, you know? It was like it was raining for a week, and then you woke up one day, and the sun was out, and the sky blue. It was like too good to be true. The dark clouds came back pretty quickly. After a month or so, just when I got used to the idea that U.S. was really gone, we got a postcard from you-know-who. It showed this pretty Thai babe, a dancer in a traditional costume with an intricate pointy headset. Her fingers were bent at an impossible angle. Her head leaned to the side, and her eyes were wide and flirty. And she had this smile on her like she was real happy. But you could tell that she was just pretending. Dear Mrs. Nguyen and family, if you are all wondering whatever happened to your Stephen, well, don't you worry. As you can tell from this postcard, I'm in Bangkok on an extended vacation. I finally decided I need to take a trip back to Nam to look at the past. I am heading home in a few weeks after much needed R&R, &R, and then I'll have a very precious gift for you and this time, you cannot possibly refuse, guaranteed. Affectionately yours, Steve. P.S. Hello, Pammy and Tammy. How are my favorite gals? What's Uncle Steve saying, Mama? Pammy asked after she was done reading the card out loud for Mama. Yeah, I joined in. What's so precious that we can't possibly refuse? Don't we always refuse? Did you say we don't need any charity? We make our own living, right, Mama? No charity, Mama agreed. Postcards, okay. Flowers, okay. Expensive gifts, not okay. She studied a postcard for a few seconds, then pinned it on the board next to the cash register with all the rest like she didn't care. But you know she was just still thinking about it. So that night, right, when we were getting ready for bed and everything, Pammy dropped the bomb. I mean, what if Uncle Steve wants to marry Mama, she said. What? I say, Miss P, you on LSD? Please, Mama and U.S., like, they haven't even dated. Wait, what am I saying? Mama never, ever dated. I just don't see it, Pammy. She's so virtuous. She lights incense in the altar, praying and talking to Papa and dead ancestors all, the, all that and every night. For God's sake, she's like, I must suffer because I'm totally a traditional Confucian Asian babe. Tell me, I swear, someday your tongue will put you in, in intensive care. 
My tongue nothing, Miss P. If you as so much as touches her, I'll shoot him right between the eyes with Papa's slingshot. I mean it. He's not right in the head. And you are, Pammy say, rolling her pretty eyes. You know what, Tammy? You should put that slingshot away when you were 12. You're a sophomore now and you're still playing with that thing, I swear. Sometimes I don't know whether you're going to end up at Stanford or in San Quentin. But that was not the end of that. Pammy paused for a few seconds and then in this totally in different, different voice in Vietnamese, all demure like she said, little monkey, mama's been alone for so long. Mama should have somebody. We shouldn't stand in the way. I didn't answer her. I just turned out the light. In the dark, I think well, I, I did what I usually do when I have a hard time falling asleep. I try to remember Papa. I have this memory of him so long ago, when I was four or five, before the asshole VCs took him, but I remember it so clearly. It's a Kodak moment. A late afternoon, a golden sun shining over the greenest rice fields you've ever seen, and the wind is blowing, making the whole field waver like it's an endless green sea. I am sitting on Papa's lap, and we're swinging on this hammock in the back of our house, looking at this emerald sea. I'm pulling on the slingshot with one hand and try to shoot, but I don't have the strength, and the rock flies less than three feet. Papa laughs and rubs my hair. Little monkey, you have to wait till you're older. By then, you have to go hunting for wild ducks and rabbits to feed me and your mother. Papa shows me how he does it. It's so easy for him, so effortless. He puts a rock in a pouch part and holds the handle in his right hand, turns his head slightly so he's looking at it from the corner of his eyes, and then he pulls the sling back, far, far back. He lets the rock zip into the air as he exhales, stuck. It hits the trunk of a star fruit tree grown by the edge of the rice paddies some 20 yards away. All of a sudden, there's this commotion and a flock of wild parrots hidden in the branches take off from the treetop, flashing their red and blue and yellow feathers, a squawking rainbow toward the sky. I remember yelling and clapping my hands. It's magic, Papa. It's awesome. My goodness, it's the best moment of my life. But the replay button in my head didn't work that night. I mean, I couldn't see Papa's face clearly not to save my life. Instead, I kept seeing you as and Mama holding hands in my head. Worse, when I fell asleep, I dreamed that Grandma T was scooping soup out of a coffin into a bowl and asked me to drink it, but I wouldn't. Then I saw Mama and U.S. rolling around on this big bed made out of a big tree branch in this big old tree house doing the wow thing. And I just sat there by the bed and cried and cried. But it was like U.S. and Mama didn't even see me, and that bumped me out totally. So maybe it was just sheer luck, or maybe it had to happen. Like Grandma T always said, be careful what you hate or God will give it to you on a lacquer tray. So when Mr. I'm also Vietnamese returned one bright Saturday morning to the tender freaking loin from, the, from overseas, he was in my target range. I mean, usually I wouldn't even think of shooting anybody from the rooftop, let alone a paid customer and a regular, no matter how much he gets in my hair. But Adam was with me. And before he saw U.S., we were already on the roof of my building, getting stoned on one of his reefers and shooting at the billboard with Papa's slingshot. The billboard was hell of a annoying. It showed this happy couple with their three children holding hands and smiling with impossibly white teeth as they walk out of this white castle. So Adam broke a candy machine the night before and stuffed his army pants pockets with jawbreakers just for me so that fake family didn't stand a chance. We sent one colorful piece of candy after another zipping toward the gringo family. Fuck, 
I took out the oldest girl's front tooth with a red jawbreaker. Stuck, Adam shot the mother in the chest. Stuck, I shot the father in the forehead. And then I just went for the baby, the one with the Mickey Mouse hat on. Stuck, stuck. I made Swiss cheese out of that little boy. We shot and shot until the roof was littered with broken candies. It looked like the, a rainbow had shattered and rained down in pieces. We couldn't stop laughing. It was my second time doing pot, but the first didn't really count. Nothing happened that first time. So how would I know I was gonna be higher than a kite the second time around? The stuff, as Adam say, was from Colombia. So it had extra strength, extra magic. One puff, I cough, curse, breathe in, breathe out, two puffs, and I had tears in my eyes, pain in my lungs, and my throat hurt like hell. Three, and boom, I was gone. I was like, oh my God, I'm swimming in this thick gold bright air. My head felt like it had that gilded <laughs> traditional hat of the Thai dancer was wearing on in US postcard. It felt heavy and weird, but kind of cool too, like the sunshine had found a way inside and was swirling around. I was laughing like a, the mad and messed up chick that I was when I saw over the parapet an all too familiar shape. He had this conical hat on his head and a red and yellow Hawaiian shirt full of flowers. And in his arm, he had a brown vase wrapped in red ribbon. If you ask me, U.S. looked like he was depriving some village somewhere of an idiot. <laughs> that's him, Adam. I say, giggling, that's him. He's back, the dude, that's the dude who's gonna try to marry my mama. Look, he's even got a wedding gift wrapped in red for her, see? That shit head down there with that funny hat, Adam said. He's the one that called me tattoo boy. Tattoo guy, I said. Who gives a fuck, Adam said. Then he had this look on his face like he just thought of something funny. Hey, he said. Tammy, listen, you can prevent a wedding. How, I said, and kept staring at the bleeding rose in the snake's mouth on his arm. When he flexed it, it seemed like it was slithering. Adam looked at me like I was real stupid. What you mean how? Look down, babe, that ain't no toy in your hand. I looked. Papa's slingshot made of mahogany and smoothed by years of use was glowing like wildfire. Adam took out an orange jawbreaker from his pants pocket, blew on it for good luck, and took my hand. He made me squeeze it, then kissed me. Do it, baby. He whispered into my face. I closed my eyes. I could taste the sweetness of his breath, feel the intense heat emanating from his body, smell his salty sweat. Do it, hurry before he's out of range. What happened next, I see it now, like watching TV in slow-mo. I see me putting the jawbreaker in the sling and pulling it far, far back. I see me taking aim at US, and then the jawbreaker just flew. It took forever to reach that conical hatchet figure down below, years, decades, centuries. And for a moment, I thought it would never reach him. But how could it not? Papa's slingshot was magic. That morning was magic. And so was Adam's candy. It hit U.S. upper left arm and shoulder with a small thud. And he automatically jerked forward and yelped. And the vase in his hand fell out of his grasp to shatter on the sidewalk in this nasty, crackling noise. No, he wailed and stepped one step forward before sinking to his knees. Then he checked his shoulder to see if he was bleeding, but of course he wasn't. Who did this? Who did this? He yelled and took off the conical hat and looked around, but didn't see anybody. 
So he looked down again at the mess. Oh, Jesus, Jesus Almighty. And then Adam had pulled me back away from the edge out of the U.S.'s sight. Holy fucking shit, Tammy. He kept hugging me and laughing like a madman. You're my girl. You're in the house. But I wasn't even listening to him anymore. U.S.'s voice was the only thing that registered. It sounded so wounded, so hurt down there, like an injured dog. I pushed Adam away. I went to the parapet and looked again. U.S. US was still down there on his knees, busy now gathering the damaged goods into the hat, while yelling something like, all that work, all that negotiation to himself. But his voice trailed off in the morning when a strange gray white powder had spilled from the broken vase and was spiraling upward from his hands and into the sky like smoke. I must have moved then, because U.S. looked up and our eyes met. Suddenly, the giggle went out of me. His eyes were in tears, and his face tanned and smeared with that great white powder was in such pain and hurt that it took my breath away. I mean, I didn't recognize it at all. But at the same time, it felt like I'd been staring at it all my life. When he spoke, his voice was all choked up. These are your father's ashes. I brought them back from Nam for you, for the family. Something had gone off in my head at that moment, a flash, I guess, or a flood of light and it formed a circle between us. We were somewhere else, another place, another morning. The street below was fast turning into a dark river, and the light poles were sprouting silvery fronds. I could almost smell the jasmine fragrance of the rice fields in the air, hear the parrots scrabbling somewhere in the sky, feel the burning heat of a tropical sun on my back. Your father's ashes, U.S. said again, and then held the conical hat with its broken urn up higher for me to see. His gift? For the first time since I knew U.S., I didn't have a thing to say to him. Not a thing. So I just stared. Then suddenly I couldn't help myself. I raised my arm high in the air and waved over and over again like I was waiting at the dock, welcoming him home or something. Thanks. Well, that took a lot out of me. That's a lot of performance right there. <laughs> and thanks, Amy, for conducting the conversation. So great, thank you. So why don't you tell us a little bit about that story and how you created it and created this character? Yeah, you know, you're a fiction writer, so you probably appreciate it more than most. A lot of time, ideas come to you out of the blue, right? Um, and sometimes it's plotted, and other times it's, you know, this story was born out of a restaurant in the Tenderloin many years ago when I went to eat a pho place that's no longer there. And the, the mother was so kind and sweet, just like the mother in the story. And the daughter, who was um, uh, in the summertime, and she was working with uh, helping her parents, was hell on will. And she was in the back, uh, in the kitchen, talking to her boyfriend. And out here, the mother was like, hi, how are you? What do you want to eat today? And then in the back, she was like, motherfucker, you want to break up with me? I'm going to break up with you. <laughs> and, I, and like the whole restaurant was like, oh my god, you know? And I laughed so hard. And I didn't think about it. I didn't think about it as a story. But I went home. I kept laughing all night long. And then her voice stuck. It was like being possessed by a girl I didn't even see. You know, she was in the kitchen. And then some times passed, and then she's in the voice, not the real girl, started telling me her story. And so I felt like being possessed a little bit, so I had to get her narrative out. And it's, it worked. You know, six months later when the story was done, uh, she stopped talking to me, thank God. Mm -hmm. um, but that's how it came about. 
Great. So one of my favorite things is her voice is so unique. And in a way, all the stories reveal a different aspect of the Bay Area. Yeah. And about this world. Can you yeah. tell us a little bit about how long did it take you to write this collection? And, and how did you realize <laughs> this was going to be a collection that really captured these unique years yeah. of a Vietnamese America in the Bay Area? You know, it felt like, <laughs> um, you know, I was in a creative writing program, um, 89 to 91. And then I got hired by Pacific News Service Bank and to become a journalist. And so I started writing fiction at the beginning, but I stopped because I became a full-fledged journalist and traveling the world, um, writing essays and so on. Um, so it was always in the back of my mind that I would want to one day revisit the fiction stuff that I created. Um, and so it's always, uh, you know, so I would say it took three and 25 years. I mean, you know, three years to really write it, but like 25 years of, of character design and thinking about it while being a journalist full time. Mm -hmm. um, but I wrote a lot more than the 13 stories. Um, it's just that when you, you know how it is, when you put together a collection, you have to get rid of stories that are too similar, you know, in terms of narrative. And so, of course, there's another collection waiting, you mm -hmm. know, because of that. But I wrote about 20 something stories and it got pared down to 13 for this collection. What made you decide on the, these 13? Did you feel like they captured a certain. Yeah, it, because it's, it's, it captures this. Um, I wanted to write about people who all have a um, point of trauma, mm. um, but all live here in the Bay Area and are adjusting on different degree um, to success or failure to American life. Um, but they all def were defined by this exodus that um, really defined a community, so. Mm -hmm. Great. So San Francisco figures as a large character also in this book, yeah. and it really does capture a lot of your feelings and a lot of the diversity that yeah. is happening in this city and, and how it's changed. Could you talk a little bit about your relationship with San Francisco as yeah. a writer and as a... Well, <laughs> I grew up here. I went to Colma uh, Junior High um, I remember when we hit the softball, it flies over the fence in the morning, it's foggy, and you have to climb over and pick it up, and you think you're in a film of, like, your night of the living dead. Um, and I went to Lowell High School, went to Berkeley, mm -hmm. came back, went to San Francisco State, and then uh, Stanford. So everything was the Bay Area. So in a weird way, my sense of America is so small, you know, San Francisco, Bay Area. And when I travel, um, to New York or you know Midwest, when it's like visiting another foreign country, you know, and especially because you know low high school, even back in the 80s, it's like half of them were a Asians already, so you didn't particularly feel like a mi minor person in San Francisco, you know. Um, so my sense of myself is kind of centralized in the narrative of San Francisco, even though you kind of know that you're marginalized on the mainstream narrative. Uh, for me, San Francisco was always diverse. You know, my friends were always a bunch of mixed kind of people. I didn't hang out with the Vietnamese community. So, you know, I have Filipino, I have white, I had Samoan, I had black friends uh, all across the board. And that had always been the way in which uh, these stories evolve is that it's never just going to be a Vietnamese person. You know, there's a white guy who wants to be Vietnamese, or there's a white kid who's going to be best friend with a Vietnamese kid. Um, there's a woman who falls in love with American GI, you know. Um, there's always going to be interaction with the larger world because that's really the story, mm -hmm. you know. So do you think your relationship with San Francisco has changed or has just deepened? It, it, it deepens, but I kind of want to leave San Francisco at some point to write about it from a distance because mm -hmm. i always been a San Franciscan boy. And frankly, speaking as a journalist, I'm, I'm growing disappointed with the way the city is going, with the, the, the wealth and the uh, poor gap so widened. And, you know, and, and uh, the, the kind of makeup of the city has changed so much compared to the middle class people that I knew that sort of defined the large world that I grew up in. Um, that much, so much has changed, you know. Uh, and a lot of artist friends have, have gone away. And so it's kind of it's kind of depressing, you know. Um, I don't know how that can be reversed, but uh, but in terms of the San Francisco of memory, you know, of the, my childhood, and there's a lot of wonderful, delightful moments. I mean, my cousin's here, <laughs> and we kind of, <laughs> I mean, our San Francisco is very different than the one that we found ourselves in today, mm -hmm. you know. I think that's interesting because so many Asian-American writers, specifically Vietnamese-American writers, seem to be 
flocking to yeah, the Bay Area right. and moving here so that there's a thriving community. Yeah, and a lot of uh, well-known Vietnamese uh, American writers come from here. I mean, mm -hmm. Quy Duc and then Viet, who went to Berkeley and mm -hmm. grew up in San Jose and now just won the Pulitzer, mm -hmm. right? So um, it is a, a fertile ground for a lot of Asian American writers. I mean, you have Maxine Hong Kingston here, you know, and so uh, Amy Tan. So there is something unique about the Bay Area with its diversity and its willingness to, to embrace different culture that allow people to don't, to not see themselves completely marginalized, but that their voice matters, you know, that there's always somebody's gonna listen to your story, that sort of thing. Right. You don't feel that way so in the Midwest, I don't think. Right, you know. and I think that's a, a large reason why this is going to continue to remain a, a pretty thriving right. cultural pot. Hopefully so. Yes, yeah. yes. So you mentioned Viet Nguyen, and so this has been a landmark year, I would yeah. say, for Vietnamese American For writers. Southeast Asian, too, yes. you know. And especially Vietnamese American men. Yes. With uh, Viet Nguyen <laughs> winning the Pulitzer for yeah. The Sympathizer, yeah. Vu Tran with Dragonfish, and Ocean Vung yeah. for the Night Sky Award. Yeah. with Exit Wounds. Um, and as a journalist, you have interviewed and um, and you know so many of these Vietnamese American yeah. writers. What what? How do you think these voices have evolved? And it, it's so wonderful, I, I have to say, because it's not just uh, writing, but films also. A couple friends of mine having the documentary around, and uh, one is Vietnamese, Chinese, and the other one is Cambodian American. And uh, the Cambodian one, I just reviewed his book called, uh, his uh, documentary called um, Days of Justice, and it's just won another award. Uh, he has got a, a kind independent award, and now he just won an indie film award for his look at um, Cambodia, you know, efforts to reconcile with the Khmer Rouge uh, memory. Why I bring him up is this. He's sort of second generation. He came when he was two or three, and he has no memory of, Viet uh, of Cambodia. And the f in the film, he's dealing with another guy who's the son of a mass murderer. And both of them came to this conclusion that they cannot ignore the past, that they need to address it, but address it from a second generation point of view. Mm -hmm. I consider myself a first, person, a first generation because I have full memory of Vietnam. I left when I was 11, uh, as a, young enough to change, but I have clear memory of the war and the exodus and the suffering. Whereas um, a lot of people like Viet or, or Ocean, they, they're, they come from a second generation mm -hmm. who decide to speak of that narrative, but a completely different angle, mm -hmm. you know? And to me, that's so refreshing and necessary mm -hmm. because who wants to, you know, it's funny. I mean, I, I still write about it, but I guess because it's my experience, but a friend of mine, he, he uh, reads uh, letters, application to colleges. Um, he's an English professor and he say, but I, you know, if I have to read, like my mother was a both person, uh, essay again, I'm gonna throw up because so many of them, right? But so if there's just too many similar narrative, it becomes boring. Whereas you have a different way of looking that same, like Viet's story is different than say both people experience, right? Mm -hmm. um, so then you're, it's refreshing because it challenges you to look at your own, look, what you thought it was your view of the history and then someone else from another point of view showed up and say, hey, you haven't seen it this way. Right. And I think it's refreshing and it's wonderful because I think that will enrich the, the way we look at history mm -hmm. rather than just, oh, we all suffer, you know, da da, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's wonderful. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I remember reading, there's been some really interesting articles, including yours, about yeah. Obama's recent visit yeah. to Vietnam. And I remember Sunny Lay. Uh, wrote a really interesting piece about how he's tired of the narrative of America coming to visit Vietnam, you are not my enemy anymore. Yeah. And Sunny pointing out, we haven't been for long, 40 long years. Yeah. And, and the narrative has to change. Right. And it has to progress. Right. I think in a way, in a way that's why it's refreshing to have new way of looking at history. Because, you know, if any country that we had uh, historical involvement with is held static to how we imagine it, that we don't really see that country for what it is. Mm -hmm. I mean, Vietnam, you know, went from 30 million to 94 million population mm -hmm. since the war ended, meaning that it's a new country, it's a greening country. You cannot just go there and say, how do you feel about the war, mm -hmm. right? Um, and people often do that. Like, how do you feel about the war? About the war? I mean, I've been with American journalists in Vietnam who like ask the kid what he thinks of the war, and you know what his answer is? What war? Which one? Because mm -hmm. to him, it's just another war, right? He didn't experience it. Just like you, I always say to the journalists, like, ask your kid how he feels about Watergate. Mm -hmm. You know, that's how it is. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so what, and there was another interesting story about how all these Vietnamese stories coming out right now. Yeah. Um, about Vietnamese Americans who've been returning to live in Vietnam, mm -hmm. Vietnamese nationals who come to America yeah. to live and work in the tech industry, yeah. right? And so there seems to be a much easier migration back and forth, which seems, and they, and they want to capture the fact that the older generations are confounded by this, but sure. the youngers are, are, are not yeah. so much anymore. Yeah, and I, I think that's, for me, it's, it's something that I have to struggle with because for me, it's always this double vision of the same story. Mm -hmm. For instance, uh, I fly across um, the Pacific Ocean basically once or twice a year um, to either work or write or, or for fun. And I always travel thinking about my relatives who escaped by boat the, uh, this way, you know, from the Pacific uh, side to over here. And, and I always thought, how is it that someone like me who's so lucky to, to have a good life and, you know, get on a plane and sometimes business class, you know, to, to Asia. And then there are people who took 15 years to cross that same ocean, you know, losing half relatives on, along the way. You know, they're, I'm not any smarter than them. It's just it's circumstances. And so when you see, and that's why there's this double vision all the time for, for people like me because, yeah, I see it, and I, I welcome this change, and young people go back and forth. I, in fact, went with a friend many years ago uh, to shop here because he didn't speak English, but he came over just to shop at uh, high-end stores. And I wrote a piece about it in East East West, but, you know, it's like, uh, you know, and I was thinking, well, wow, you know, this is, the, uh, imagine, you know, go back 15 years, and they were writing letters from Vietnam asking for a care package because Vietnam was so poor. Right, and we had to mail antibiotics and you know high money in the toothpaste so that they can survive back home, and you know within uh, you know 10, 15 years that whole world shifted, and then there are rich people who fly over to go shop at you know you know <laughs> Prada, you know, so it's like quite stunning uh, a shift, right? Mm -hmm. I wanted to leave some time for questions from the audience. I think Naomi had uh, a microphone in case anyone wanted to ask anything. So any questions about um, Andrew's books <laughs> and about uh, commentary on just the relationship, I think, between Vietnam and America? I'm going to take the Twitter. Don't be shy. Yeah, don't be shy. I have my glasses on so I can see you now. <laughs> oh, over here. They're bringing it for you. They're bringing it, yeah. I see that your story, The Palmist, is in there. Yeah. And I read it when it came out um, and then heard it on, I think, it w who was it read uh, by on Public NPR? Public Radio International, I think. Yeah, who was it read by? Do you remember? Uh, oh, it was read by uh, David Strathairn yeah. of Good Night and Good Luck. Yeah, That was yeah. on um, uh, Selected Shorts, yeah. Yeah, and um, I had... I had um, shared it with my high school students, mm -hmm. my creative writing kids, and they just really loved it. And I, I was thinking about, um, like, I never did really ask you where, where that story came from. Yeah. Like, when she was asking you that, I thought, where did that story come from? Right. Um, so the poem is, is uh, claims to fame is that it was read on selected shorts it was in New York and to millions of people who managed to listen to it on, on NPR and American Public Radio, I think, but um, and they they want me to come out there, but the, they pay me three thousand bucks, and it, and last minute it will cost three thousand bucks to go li listen to my own story read in New York, but so I didn't go. <laughs> but the the story is about this kid who took the thirty eight Gary. How many people know the thirty eight Gary mm -hmm. exactly? You know, if you're on the thirty eight Gary, a lot of shit happens on that bus. <laughs> I mean. And I used to live in the Richmond, you know, Southern and, and Clement area. And, it, and I used to see like all kind of stuff. I mean, I can write a whole novel about the 38 Gary. Um, but then I just, one day I just sat there and this story kind of came up, like this palmist who's dying and his last reading is on the 38 Gary. And so I was on the 38 Gary when the story came to me. And it took me maybe 12 different drafts before it became the way it is. But I wrote it, it didn't make any sense, and I left it for three years before I came back. Yeah. It's in the, um, in the collection if you have a chance to read it. I usually talk loud enough. 
Okay. Okay. Uh, microphone, but there's there's different pockets of Vietnamese mm -hmm. people who came over. There's lots in Texas. There's here. Yeah. There's pockets on the East Coast. So is there a group connectedness to them, or do you find their experiences in, in Texas different than what they have on the West Coast or the East Coast? Well, Amy can speak to yeah. Southern Cal and Texas. Oh yeah. Well, Southern California, I'm from Southern California, so, I mean, little Saigon there has changed so much. Yeah. It's, it's, it's amazing. It's, it's beautiful. It's the place that my parents probably would have wanted in the 70s when they first came here, where there's a pho restaurant down the street from where they had a house for 35 years. There is uh, Ranch 99, all these things. Oh, nice. Yes, <laughs> it's, 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 it's amazing. And, and a lot of uh, the most innovative Taiwanese dessert shops open up. Yeah. First in Orange County, more than anywhere else. So I feel like there's a, it's 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 very strong and modern, and really savvy. I have relatives in Texas, who are incredibly conservative and Republican, despite being in you know uh, Vietnamese American. And so you do notice an identity forming yeah. that the the Vietnamese Americans in Louisiana. Very and different then, too. Yes, and then the the Vietnamese in the Midwest. They all have a strong yeah, identity. I mean, there are interconnectedness by, you know, religious connection, like different churches or temples and political uh, association. But in terms of cultural makeup of the loca local area, it certainly varies. I mean, I, I have relatives in New Orleans who speak, speak with a twang, you know, and I love it because I go down there and in five minutes I start picking up the New Orleans accent because mm -hmm. uh, that's just the way I am, <laughs> you know. And, and then I have uh, relatives in Miami and, and Orlando who are very much like beach bums and they kind of like on the beach all the time and you know and and then uh, Silicon Valley is like a lot of my friends from Berkeley 60% uh, were EECS majors so they're all high-tech people mm -hmm. and they're running like high-tech company and they talk microchip and that's why I don't go to reunion because they're all show-offs I mean they're like <laughs> oh shit is this online no, just, sorry guys but <laughs> but then you know they're like look at my company or look at my Mercedes you know there's a lot of wealth and now that uh, and and it's all uh, it's kind of you know all high tech talk you know so there is a a different a different shade of Vietnamese obviously yeah hey Andrew uh, curious about your writing process um, so to hone in on like uh, the the tenderloin piece that you just read yeah um, the, the, with the possessed uh, girl yeah and I really got the possessed thing um, what like what was your like the workflow behind that writing process did you you know, did you like snap a picture of her, put her on the wall and go, okay, for one hour, I'm just gonna write what she's gonna write. You know, I'm just curious right. about the nitty gritty. Yeah, about, uh, you know, it's, it's weird because uh, creative process can be weird. Like, um, there's another piece in this book that um, it's called uh, Grandma's Tales. And this is a piece that has been anthologized maybe 12 times, you know, and taught at many university. And if you ask me how I wrote that, I have no clear memory of writing it. Mm. Uh, I wrote it in two days uh, when I had a fever, uh, and I didn't even know what it was when it was published. Um, but I wrote it without thinking. So that's another way. Is like uh, I think uh, John Gardner called it jazzing around when you just let the like the musicality of the words flow out. And then um, there are pieces in here that is plotted, meaning that I have a concept. You know, this woman who owns a restaurant, she uh, falls in love with this man who she thinks had murdered her husband when they were farmers back in Vietnam, but now she's American, and um, what's she going to do with him, right? So that was a concept, and I had to build something concrete out of it. But I, I would suggest that instead of thinking of um, the structure of your workflow, what you should really try to understand is the human character. Because without understanding the human character, his or her yearning and desires and fear and things that she or he won't even admit to himself, without understanding that part, you can never create, it, create good fiction. It's always the human desire that you need to understand before you can flow, right? Um, because all, all human character is destiny. They act on their desire and then things happen in the world. Um, so for me, it's, an, it's about the well-roundedness of a character. I have to believe that she's real, right? This dude, right? right? I, be, I mean, actually, I didn't have to believe she's like, didn't get out of my head, but, you know, so that there are, once you know who she is, it's like, 
damn, man, I, that girl, I know what she would do if she were in this situation, right? Once you know who she is, her story just flow, right? So. Any other questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Question I have is, um, I'm one of business and not good at storytelling like you are, but the trend of storytelling is really being taught to us, whether it be in social media or storytelling in talks and um, you know business, you know storytelling. So just as you think about storytelling, you know how would you connect it to those of us in other forays and thoughts around storytelling? Um, well, maybe Amy can also address this, but um, I think without the ability to tell story, we wouldn't connect to one another. I think we naturally tell stories without thinking about it. Um, when we go to a party, the, the typical American question is, so what do you do, right? Um, that is like a tweet right there, right? Uh, what you do is what your story is, right? How we see ourselves. We, we spend so much of our time creating this whole narrative about who we are by what we do, especially in America where identity is so formed by, by work um, that we tell story naturally without thinking about it. Oh yeah, I make computers, you know, I put uh, chips together. How do you do that? You know, I went to college and you know, I was going to be an art major, but my I'm I was always good with uh math and so I just thought, "Hey, you can make money from this." And so I got into it and one thing you need to know that I, I did my startup and now I'm richer than God, right? Whatever it is. Uh I just made that up, but uh, but we all tell story without thinking about it. So storytelling is not something unnatural. It's just the way when you're consciously thinking about it that becomes a, a kind of way, like, oh, I don't know how to tell this story. We've been telling story all the time. My mother's a natural storyteller, and she's like one of the best storytellers I know. She doesn't think about it. You know, you give her something and she just play with it until, you know, a narrative comes out. And then she even uh, changed narratives in mid-sentence in order to make it work for what her purpose is. For instance, my mother um, all, you know, resented the fact that when I went to Berkeley, I rarely come home to see her. I'm the youngest and most adored, whatever. And so she was telling the story how she was uh, allergic to Novocaine. And I came home uh, to surprise her while she was telling my aunt the story. And what happened in the story is that uh, she had overdosed on Novocaine injection or something, and she knew she was gonna go under um, and she might not survive when she, this was when uh, back in Vietnam and we were young and and she said you know in my head I think if I die who's gonna raise my children especially my youngest son right I heard this story many times but as I walk in as she was telling this story she turned and saw me and she say but you know what if they inject me with this Novocaine now I say please give me another because why, why would I live? I have no reason to live because my, my youngest son, my youngest son, he, he doesn't care, you know? I, yeah, make me feel numb because I'm ready to go under now. And I just stood there and I... <laughs> you see what I mean? The storytelling, turn it into a joke, make you feel guilty like you're a Jewish mother, you know? It's, all in, it's, all, it's always been there. It's always been there. You just have to kind of realize it. Yeah, I'm Jewish. So um, I recently accepted um, an affiliate artist position at the Headlands Center oh. for the Arts. So um, I'm excited about that. So That's for the next wonderful. year, I'll be. Thank you. So the, for the next year, I'll be writing up there. Yay! It'll take me 45 minutes it's to get there. It's beautiful up it there. It's beautiful. And they'll have open studios, and um, I think I'm at a point in my writing where I'm really, I really like the idea of exploring and collaboration. And I'm in a collaboration right now with um, a Vietnamese-American feminine collective with writers that yeah. Andrew knows, and, and Thang, um, Thang Dao right there. She's a member as well, but it includes Isabel Pilod, Dao Strom, Bit Nguyen, Angie Chow, and so the idea is to create work together. Wonderful. Yes. Yeah, so we'll be at the Bay Area Book Festival next weekend. Yeah, I'll be there too, June mm -hmm. uh, 3rd. 5th? 5th. Yeah. Other projects? Oh, my project. Sorry. <laughs> I forgot. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm working on a novel um, based on a real life story. So that's sort of my focus right now. Um, but 
um, in the back burner, uh, these other stories that didn't make it to this one, um, they tend to be more sexual, uh, more like younger generation um, looking, like from the point of view of second generation looking at the war or not looking at the war at all. Um, and just sort of uh, more distant from the point of PTSD, which basically a lot of these stories deal with. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm working on those two projects right now. Thank you. Well, thank you for coming and uh, go eat. You're hungry. Right? <laughs>